Okay, thanks, Peter. Thanks, Michael. Um, is Sharon Burrow, Sharon's there, isn't she? Yeah. She wants it. I'm going to ask uh, Colin, our, one of our guest speakers at the conference, Sharon Burrow, who's the General Secretary of the International uh, and Trade Union Con Congress. Sharon, you're, you're very welcome. Um, if you're organised and ready, you can... Thank you. John, uh, Patricia, I want to talk to you about your campaign, which is a recognition that austerity has failed and that unions and workers are fighting back. But I want to do it in the global context. So let me say, first of all, congratulations, John and Patricia. Congratulations to the trade union men and women of Ireland for standing up against low pay and exploitative working conditions. My maiden name is Murphy, so the affinity I feel with the ICTU is born of generations of shared family history. Delegates, inequality is now recognised, even by the arbiters of austerity, as an economic risk. Sadly, not because of the plight of people, as their actions reinforced by the scandalous way they are treating the people in Greece, but nevertheless a recognition of economic risk. We can use that. Your fight is critical for Irish workers and their families, but it's also inspiring our global fight to build the power of workers and to tame corporate power. When David Cameron today said uh, he would champion a living wage by nine pound, of nine pounds by 2020, that's a target that he would endorse as a living wage, but he's clearly never tried to live on it. Let me introduce you to the global workforce and the scope of our collective fight. There are around 2.9 billion workers in the global workforce. Only 60% of workers have a job in the formal economy and more than half of their work is precarious. Then there are 40% of our brothers and sisters struggling in the informal economy with no minimum wage, no social protection, indeed no labour rights, no legislative rights that cover them in any way, shape or form. And these numbers are increasing. The informal economy is eating away at decent work and you can see that right here in Ireland because it's not just a developing economy uh, syndrome. Then, of course, there are around 30 million of our people enslaved in forced labour or modern-day slavery. And, of course, the delegate and the wage share of national wealth keeps falling in almost all nations over the last 30 years, while CEO pay in countries like the US has risen by 90 per cent, sorry, 90 times that of a typical worker since 1980. And safety, of course, is just not a priority for too many workers. But then 75% of the world's population have no or inadequate social protection. The social protection floor consists of just a few percentage points of GDP. That's what it would cost, just a few percentage points of GDP for those essential public services, pensions, unemployment benefits, child protects, protection, education and health. And yet, 75% of our brothers or sisters have no such guarantees. Indeed, we know that social protection, and you've just heard about the pensions here, is a fundamental basis of reducing inequality, it's about social cohesion, and it's actually a basic floor of demand. But when we see workers' taxes being used for everything but the public services and the support for which we pay the, uh, the taxes in the first place. But we also see governments champion tax evasion of corporations, then we have a problem. And it's a problem that you will stand up for, including alongside the rest of the workers of the world. So we know that inequality is a matter of political choice, nationally and internationally and it's fuelled by the dominant model of global trade. The biggest companies in the world depend on supply chains that are built on a model of exploitative wages, unsafe and insecure work. 
When our corporations can't pay $177 a month in Cambodia, or $250 in Jakarta, or $120 in Bangladesh, something is very wrong. It's called corporate greed. When you meet a textile worker like Rena, as I did three weeks ago in the Philippines, and she tells me, when I ask her what she wants most from her company, she doesn't say wages, even though she can't live on the wages she has. She doesn't say stop the guards uh, escorting me to the toilet and treating me as uh, someone less than human. She doesn't say I want decent food and a lunch hour I can actually touch. What she says is, I want an end to forced overtime. I want to be able to tell my 12-year-old son, who I am worried about in terms of his safety, that I can cook him a meal at night, or indeed I can say good night to him when I don't know if I'm going to be home by 10, 12, 2, 4 in the morning. That's not decent work. And of course, when men gathering seafood for many of our tables are enslaved in boats in the Indonesian waters, without living quarters and sanitation for months on end, there is no hope for them of decent work without us. And you know the story of slavery that we are fighting in Qatar and the deep corruption of FIFA and all the construction and service companies, our companies, making profits from the shame of the World Cup in a slave state. We will not give up on slavery. Delegates, I'm privileged to meet the workers who are the producers of the world's wealth all around the world. But many of them get to share little or none of it, and worse, many of them are invisible with no voice. I get angry with them on your behalf. I cry with them. They are courageous men and women. They are our brothers and indeed our working family. Brothers and sisters and indeed our working family. A brother this morning cited the American Chamber of Commerce as champions of a volunteerist model of collective bargaining. In fact, can I tell you, the American Chamber of Commerce is our number one enemy. They are evil and they're insidious everywhere. They're not content to drive an anti-union culture in the US. They are everywhere threatening governments with capital flight if they raise minimum wages or strengthen labour rights. If governments are coward, and they are, then only we can stand up to their zero hours contracts and their low paid vision of a perfect world for corporate profits. And you are doing just that. You are showing the way to defeat them. To the Duns workers and all the other disputes here, you have global solidarity for your struggle. And of course, it is these American companies demanding the ISDS disputes mechanism within the TTIP, the right to demand taxpayer dollars to prop up their claims for potentially lost profits. Imagine that. Now that's socialism but it's actually socialising corporate greed. So in Asia, we've started the fight back. We've launched the campaign to end corporate greed and we will extend this campaign through the supply chains in Latin America and Asia in 2016. The World Day for Decent Work in October 7 this year will be dedicated to campaigns for safe and secure work, for minimum living wages and social protection, under the umbrella slogan of end corporate greed. The ITUC Global Index details the worst places in the world for workers to work. And let me tell you, it's pretty shocking when in almost 60% of countries, certain types of workers are excluded from their fundamental labour rights. 70% of countries have workers with no right to strike including many public sector workers in developed economies. And indeed, uh, two thirds of countries deny workers collective bargaining rights. More than half of the countries in the survey deny workers access to the rule of law. And we know from the figures that shockingly, unionists arrested and murdered are on the increase, including in European countries like Spain, where workers face jails for striking against austerity 
or indeed migrant workers risk their lives for the right to work. The shocking reality is that while the Gulf states are the worst region in the world, it is Europe, it's actually Europe that represented the greatest decline in respect for workers' rights and entitlements. It's called austerity. There is some shifts, however. The G7 put supply chains on the agenda for the first time and recognised the responsibility of their global companies to respect fundamental labour rights and ensure due diligence through the supply chains. We've also put it on the G20 agenda and there will be an ILO discussion at the conference next year in 2016. The trust in corporations is broken. Indeed, we polled uh, countries just before the G7 meeting and in, in uh, countries in developed economies like France, Germany, the UK and the USA, more than 55% of workers said companies couldn't be trusted to look after workers and that tougher laws were needed. It's not surprising that 80% of workers in uh, countries like Indonesia, the Philippines and Turkey believe that most employers prioritise profits over safety and indeed 78% wanted a decent minimum wage, a wage on which they can live. So the breakdown in trust with corporations puts the onus back onto governments to ensure the rule of law. This year, the world's leaders will endorse the Sustainable Development Goals and full employment and decent work with universal social protection are central to those goals. I ask you to watch the position of your own government to see that they stand up for just that. Now, I can't leave you without a word on climate, for the destruction of lives and livelihoods is staring us in the face. We have a simple message as trade unions, there are no jobs on a dead planet. And 90% of respondents to the ITUC poll show that their citizens are way ahead of their governments. When 90% of people in more than countries with more than 50% of GDP just a month ago say they want to see leaders take action to prevent climate change, and a total of 79% one action in the next 12 months or less. It makes the joke of the targets being put forward by uh, our governments to the Paris Agreement discussions very, very obvious. Government ambition is too low and no country has a national plan. Not one country has a national plan. No industry has a collective agreement with unions for the transition that is imperative, indeed, the planning for a just transition that means no worker is left behind. So the challenge of decarbonisation is a task for all of us. Jobs are already being lost and workers and their communities have a right to know what their governments and their employers' plans to decarbonise, to protect and grow jobs are in a clean economy. I hope we will see some of you at our union uh, summit, our climate summit in Paris in September, with stories of what could be done in our workplaces. Finally, let me congratulate you and indeed share your joy in the inspirational referendum on marriage equality. Your pride, your pride in this act. Your pride in this act of solidarity and respect for the love of in that individuals have for each other and their families is so well deserved and I'm proud to wear your badge. And just as you celebrated this amazing act of democratic power, of the power, you will celebrate also the victory of the fundamental social justice that your fight for a living wage and decent working conditions represents. Patricia, your leadership as the first woman secretary, this will be grand. You will lead the fight with all union leaders and indeed, most importantly, union members and their families in, the, in their workplaces organising, organising for workplace justice. Together, together, we can actually, within and across nations, build the power of workers that will end corporate greed. We must and we will. Solidarity.
Uh, Brian is now going to make a presentation to Sharon for her great work for the trade union movement on the international front.